for the plant. Maybe I have been in this one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should I be moving now? You should uh, mute your. Yeah, I did. Yeah, thanks. And, uh, yeah. Press, press your report. Okay, thanks. Do you hear me? Okay, can I start? Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Okay, um, I'm Chohan Park, and I will today I will talk about two different things. The second, I will talk about the second one first. I'm from Seoul National University, in Korea. Ah, thank you very much for organizing this wonderful workshop uh, from which I benefited much and I think I will be. So I, I really appreciate uh, the, the efforts of the organizers and also the participants. Thanks a lot. So I will talk about the second topic first and then the first one, but the reason why I made my title this way is that if I switch the order, then it's a bit confusing. Okay, um, today I will uh, talk about two works which were done by uh, two of my graduate students who are very smart and extremely hardworking. Okay, Chemo and Minsu. First, I will talk about Vanier function perturbation theory. And, okay. Um, we, when we want to calculate the matrix elements like some generic operator O, or for example, the phonon perturbation V that is characterized by the phonon momentum Q. So, yeah, we want, when we want to calculate these matrix elements, uh, here the size are the energy eigenstates. What we normally do is we calculate this, these matrix elements within the Vanier function, localized Vanier function basis, like these or that. And from that, we do Fourier transform, and then we can uh, obtain these matrix elements at many, many K points uh, with very low computational cost. And this part was done by this work and in this part was done first by uh, this work. And let's now uh, move on to different quantity. Uh, here's an example, phonon induced electron self energy, but we will focus on the upper fan, so-called upper fan part which we, have, we sum over all the phonon modes. And then for each phonon mode, we sum over the electron bands whose energy is above a certain critical value. And we, we sum these uh, terms, okay? And if you look at this, it looks like some first order perturbation to the energy eigenstate, right? Except that you don't sum over every all the states. So we can change this uh, by this in square bracket. So we first do this first order correction to the energy eigen state and then subtract the remainder, which is the states whose energy is below the critical value. And we know that this part can be very efficiently calculated. Uh, with Vani interpolation because we know we can interpolate the matrix elements and the energy eigenvalues and so on. But for this one, um, one can obtain this by solving Sternheim equation, but which is not very cheap. Okay, so this is the bottleneck to calculate the electron self energy at many, many K points. 
let's discuss another different topic, which is shift current. I will not show you the entire equation for calculating shift current, but in order to calculate shift current, we need to evaluate uh, this summation over infinite number of bands. Okay. And so let's discuss uh, this work in 2006. So the U's are the eigenstates of H of K. And if we uh, change K by K plus DK, then it will be the original H of K plus this small perturbation, okay, DK dot V of K. And uh, for this perturbation, U of NK will change to U of N K plus DK because our Hamiltonian is now K plus DK. So we know that uh, this state can be written as this uh, derivative over K times uh, DK. So if our, the perturbation is this, we know that our first order wave function correction is given by that, okay? And we know very well how to evaluate uh, this derivative uh, which can be written using Vanier functions like this. And we know how to deal with this guy and that guy very well. So we, yeah, we know very well about uh, this. So this thing uh, whose perturbation is VK, the, we know the first order wave function correction is just uh, the momentum derivative of this U wave function. So it can be calculated without summing over infinite number of bands. Although there are beautiful covariant derivative physics, uh, shift vector and so on, it's not the focus of this presentation. So I will not discuss that today. And let's change this uh, velocity operator by um, spin uh, current operator, which is that given by this. Now we have the spin direction uh, as well. So from our previous discussion, we know that we can write this down as this, like this, the perturbation, to, first order perturbation to the wave function due to a perturbation of this guy. But uh, there is no easy way uh, to calculate this one as in shift charge current in the shift spin current case. One can do Sternheim equation, but uh, if we need this to evaluate this at many, many K points, then it will be too heavy. Here's the last example. So in order to evaluate uh, the anomalous whole conductivity, one has to calculate this Kubo formula. And we know that it can be written like this, right? So yeah, two uh, perturbations. Actually, uh, we don't, so we don't need the in, sum over infinite number of bands, uh, but in practice, we do better than this. We uh, convert it to um, difference between the derivative of a uh, very connection. So we only need R and H matrix element, and we don't need uh, R square like this. But yeah, that's not the main focus of this presentation, so I will not go into that. And let's see what happens if we replace this VB by uh, this spin current operator. And actually, uh, this uh, so evaluating this sum over reasonably large number of bands using Vani interpolation uh, have been done by uh, these two groups, including myself and Igor and Jimin as well. Uh, and we can convert it to the first order wave function correction, the inner product. So for the same reason, Sternheim equation is not easy to solve for many, many K points. So uh, what we want to have is uh, these following matrix elements. 
at uh, many, many K points. And all of them involves the first order correction to the energy eigenstate. And so how do we do that? So we change the Hamiltonian, we perturb it by uh, adding small perturbation. Lambda is a small parameter. And then the energy eigenstate will change to, uh, will be a function of lambda, the, the zeroth order term and the first order term correction and, and so on. And also we can binarize this perturbed system. And let's say our binarized uh, binary, binary function for this perturbed system is a function of lambda a zeroth order term and the first order correction and so on. So what we are interested in is this guy at many, many K points, right? And, but in order to obtain this guy and many, many K points, so uh, what we did with the unperturbed Hamiltonian is that we need matrix elements involving this guy at many, many K points. And what we did was we calculate the Vanier function of this unperturbed system and then construct the Hamiltonian using those localized Vanier function basis. And then uh, we uh, do the unitary transform and then we diagonalize the, it and we find the energy eigen vector. And then, and then we, uh, cal we can calculate the matrix elements involving these things easily. So the first step was to binarize the system. And so what we have to do is to find the Vanier functions of the perturbed system. And from here, we can go to um, the eigenstates of the perturbed system. And since now we know both of these, we can subtract them and then we can obtain the first order correction to the energy eigenstate. So that's the strategy. So as I said, we first find the wave function, Vanier functions for the perturbed system. And then one can calculate as we did for unperturbed system, one can calculate the real space matrix elements of different types using coarse grid uh, K points. And then um, one can calculate, uh, so just uh, as we did for unperturbed system, uh, calculate the matrix element of the, using the Vanier functions, we calculate the Hamiltonian matrix elements, and then we diagonalize it. And from that, we can obtain the perturbed energy eigenstates as we did for unperturbed system. And using those perturbed energy eigenstates, we can calculate all the necessary matrix elements at, at many, many K points. So it's exactly the same as unperturbed system. We just do it for a perturbed system. And in order to find the Vanier functions, uh, uh, the disentanglement is very important in this theory. Yeah, which you all know, so I'll just skip discussion. So we have to choose um, the correct st states to make the, the Vanier function uh, smooth in momentum space. And we will adopt this entanglement plus projection only scheme for the perturbed system to find the uh, Vanier functions for the perturbed system. So uh, what they did in this paper is to project to the initial guess uh, at, at a given K point, and they, yeah, they do this. And so states which have large overlap with this initial guess will have a large weight. So we, we choose the states, the block states that have large overlap with the initial guess. And for later use, we can change that into some vector R and using the block theorem, uh, this guy will spit out 
e to the minus i k dot r factor. So this one cancels that one. So these two are equivalent. And then we do loading autonormalization, uh, which I learned from Andrea sitting over there while I was in Oxford. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we do the loading autonormalization. And then our, we can, from that, by performing Fourier transform, we can obtain the Vanier function localized in real space. We do this. And if we neglect the autonormalization process, assuming that they are very well localized, then we can just plug this into here. Okay. And this factor cancels that one. So it's basically our uh, initial guess and then this projection operator. So that's, that gives us the localized Vanier function. And now, uh, this entanglement projection only, and we will add inner window. So the idea is that um, we want this smaller window to be uh, perfectly uh, vanierized, which means that it gives the correct value at coarse grid k points. And then above this window, we choose the states which have maximal overlap with the initial guess. So we have this projector of the initial guesses. Okay. And then um, we calculate this uh, overlap the, yeah, to the energy eigenstates above this uh, inner energy window. We don't do this for this below uh, wave functions, but we do this for above states. And it will be like that. Okay, so I just, uh, yeah, subtract it, change this R to zero, and then have this vector here. Okay, for the same reason. Yeah. And if you sum over R, then it will give a delta function of K and K prime should be the same. And then the summation over I will be like this. So we sum over this projector, and we uh, calculate the matrix elements of the block states above the inner energy window, outside the inner energy window, and then diagonalize it, and then find the eigenstates of the, this uh, uh, occupation matrix, which has lar largest eigenvalues, so which has large overlap with the initial case, and choose the correct number of states for each K point. And so since we have a few uh, below the energy, energy, inner energy window, we will have just the, the, the total number of Vanier functions minus, minus, or the initial guess, minus the, the, the states inside the inner energy window. Okay. So uh, to find the Vanier functions for the perturbate, perturbed system, so the, these are done to find the Vanier functions of the perturbed system. So this entanglement, projection only. And here is the important point. The unperturbed Vanier functions are used as initial guesses. So because the original system and the perturbed system will be very similar to each other. And yeah. And when the lambda goes to zero, then they will be the same. So these are used as initial guesses. And uh, a smaller inner, one has to choose a smaller inner energy window for reasons that will become clear in the next slide. So, yeah. So we have to reduce the, energy, the, the exact inner energy window a little bit. And one should use the same outer window, this entanglement window, or even larger one. And this last condition guarantees, and all the, and this using the interval binary functions as initial guesses, guarantees continuity at lambda equals zero. So if the outer window for the per, 
perturbed uh, binarization of the perturbed system is lower, smaller than the outer window of the original system, then we will not recover uh, the original binary functions because we don't have uh, all those things. So it will not be uh, continuous at lambda equals zero. So the outer window of the perturbed system should be the same or larger than the, the original outer window. Even if it is large at lambda equals zero, it only picks up the states inside the original outer window. So it can be large. And this again is the, this projection matrix elements where it's the same as the one that I have shown you before. Our Gs, the initial guesses, are just the unperturbed binary functions. So we sum over I and R as we did before. And then uh, we calculate the matrix elements. And these are the states, the design states are the states of the perturbed system, which is exactly what we did for in the previous case. And then we'll have the this zeroth order one, which will just give us uh, uh, the occupation ones for the unperturbed uh, uh, Banyan functions. And then we have some extras here. Of course, yeah, proportional to lambda. For example, if our V has phonon with momentum Q, then it will put it'll have non-vanishing matrix elements between K and K plus Q and so on. But anyway, we diagonalize uh, this. So we include all the states inside the inner window, which is smaller than the original inner window. And then for other outer states, uh, we uh, choose select states which maximizes the uh, overlap with the initial guess. We do exactly the same thing. So here, um, so this is the outer, this is the um, outer window, which in our case, we, we choose the same outer window for both perturbed and unperturbed system, but our perturbed outer window can be larger than this. Yeah, and it may, be helpful in some cases. And this is the inner unperturbed inner window of the unperturbed system WF. And then uh, we, we choose the inner window of the perturbed system smaller than that. And right, in this energy range, right, sorry, yeah. And then this is, so, what we do, if we do what I just discussed, then we obtain these results, which is the first order correction to the uh, Banyan function, localized Banyan function, which uh, this part is just a, a Fourier, trans, Fourier transform to a Banyan gauge, and then Fourier transform to localized state. Sorry, it's a gauge transformation and then Fourier transform. And here, um, it will have a first order correction to the wave, fun wave function. And then it projects to the window outside the disentanglement window. So these high energy states. And so these guys will be obtained by solving Sternheim equation for coarse K grid points. And there, there is the, this second piece, which is the, the same thing, but projected onto this uh, D minus W, D minus W is basically in this energy window. But um, um, so, but this boundary between the states, the manifold of uh, Vanier states and the ones not chosen in the Vanier states are not uh, separated by energy. So, and so if our inner window was the same as the inner window of the unperturbed system, so we may have a, a diverging 
divergence uh, in here because uh, so it will connect. So this is for states inside the inner window. And if it connects to the states, uh, if our inner, sorry, if our inner in window was the same as the original inner window, then it will have some uh, contribution connecting to the states just outside this inner window. So we might have some singularity in here, which will make the binary functions less localized. So by choosing the inner window of the perturbed system smaller than the inner window of the original system, it prevents uh, those singularities and, and makes uh, the binary functions uh, well localized. Yeah, for this part, we don't need Sternheimer we, we, because yeah, we have finite number of states, we can calculate this thing by just using first order perturbation theory. So uh, suppose that this uh, dashed curve is shows the Vanier function of the original system. And this yellow one is the Vanier function of the slightly perturbed system. And so our um, new Vanier function is, uh, can be decomposed into the original Vanier function, zeroth order one plus first order term, which is plus and minus here. And so uh, this is the Vanier function for silicon with optical phonons that the atoms are moving this way and that way like that. And this was the original uh, Vanier function. And so it looks like this sphere. And so uh, according to this movement, it'll become like this, uh, this lock, which looks like that, and so on. And also, um, this is the Vanier function for um, tungsten telluride. And, the, and this is the original Vanier function. It's thin polarized along plus z direction, and it's some d-like character. And then the perturbation is uh, for jxx, which is the spin is along x direction, and the velocity is also along x direction. So the velocity operator is like uh, P, which is the uh, derivative. So if we take the derivative along this direction, then it will look more or less like this, okay? And also the is spin along X. So if we apply spin along X to the spinner polarized along plus C direction, it will switch back to minus C. So our the, the perturb Vanier function perturbation looks like this and it agrees with our physical intuition. And I will give, uh, give you um, three examples. The first one is the indirect optical absorption in silicon. So this is the silicon band structure. And although the direct gap is large, so optical absorption occurs below this di direct gap and that is due to the indirect absorption through the help of uh, phonons, either absorbing a phonon or emitting a phonon. And this is the experimental results. So the absorption uh, spectroscopy um, below the, this direct uh, uh, valence to conduction transition threshold. And um, so it is easier, so at low energy, uh, we can absorb a phonon and go to this conduction band state. So the absorbing a phonon process starts at a lower energy, omega. So this is the absorbing phonon process. And then when the uh, photon energy is higher, then uh, emitting a phonon can contribute to uh, indirect absorption as well. So at this point, at higher energy, both absorbing and absorption and emission participates in uh, indirect absorption. So the slope changes and there is a kink. And initially when t equals zero, there is no absorption. So the emission is strong, is much stronger. And, and as you increase the temperature, there will be more uh, phonons. So, uh, uh, phonon absorption process also increases. 
and both absorption and emission increases. And, and, and also another thing is that as you increase the temperature, the, the, due to the electron phonon coupling, the, uh, cell, the band gap decreases. And that is why that is the, the, the origin of this red shift. Okay, so uh, one has to, in order to uh, understand this experimental result, one has to calculate the phonon induced electron self energy at many, many K points. Okay, it's not along, uh, sing along some high symmetry directions, but one needs to calculate this at many, many K points. And, but that was not done before. Um, and at, by the way, they actually calculated this indirect absorption, but they did temperature dependent arbitrary shift to compare with the experiment. Whereas uh, this work done by Zacharias, Patrick and Justino, they um, used uh, some random configuration of a supercell and they designed very clever way to find the, the correct uh, random configuration. But uh, their calculation is uh, non-adiabatic because they look at the frozen uh, atoms. And so uh, even if they can describe the decrease in the band gap, they cannot describe the, this kink because they, there is no difference in, their, in this theory, the phonon absorption or emission. So, so far, uh, th there has been no theory that explains this without arbitrary shift and also the, the explain these kink behaviors. So using our Vanier function perturbation theory, uh, we could explain these experimental results quite well. And sorry, uh, so this is the last example. And so this is the spin shift spin current of this material and this thing here. So um, the blue curve, is the Vanier function perturbation theory result. And the orange curve is the Vanier function interpolation results with uh, some finite truncation. And the green curve is the difference between them. And you could see that um, the difference is quite large. And here um, we calculated the anomalous, sorry, uh, normal charge shift, shift charge current and there, uh, because of the reason I, that we discussed, there is an exact formalism. So our theory agrees with the exact formalism. Yeah. But here, there is no exact uh, uh, formalism like this one. So we cannot compare, but we, we can see that the error is not uh, negligible. And sorry, yeah, I'll move on to the second part. And this part will be uh, faster because the paper is shorter. Not that the paper is less important, but yeah, shorter. So um, we are interested in the momentum space integration of these quantities, where the delta is the energy difference at the same k point uh, between two different bands. Actually, uh, this guy, the second one, is comes from the energy conserving delta functions. So how to, uh, the tetrahedron method for this guy is very uh, popular and is much used in different softwares. But um, to evaluate these things, um, the non-energy conserving part, but the non-dispersive part of spectral functions, uh, one has to do different uh, tetrahedron. So we want to do tetrahedron method, but uh, this part, the tetrahedral methods are not uh, applied uh, these days. So let me give you an example. So this is spin hole conductivity and one has to evaluate these things. So in tetrahedral method, what, they, what we do is that we uh, make this part, the numerator, a linear function inside the tetrahedron. And also this delta, the energy difference uh, between two bands, also a linear function within the tetrahedron. And depending on whether we have zero frequency or finite frequency, it reduces to either this form or that form. So, and that form was not, has, yeah, hasn't been studied before. 
And there is actually a theory on the, this, the non dissipative power tetrahedral method in 1981. And so only type one, not type three, but um, this is part of the result. So, so this V uh, are the energy difference at four different vertices. And depending on which one of the uh, energy difference at the, the vertices are the same or not the same, they have uh, uh, formulas uh, in eight different ways. But the, uh, the difficulty of implementing this uh, theory is that there is no criterion for when they are the same and when, they, when the energy differences are different. So maybe this is the reason these complications and also this is the reason why this method has not been used much or used in uh, contemporary softwares. So the, let me de uh, describe the problem. So we know that uh, this uh, value in the limit x goes to zero is one. But the problem is that when we do this uh, using computer, when X is very small, like 10 to the minus, for example, in, if you're using a double precision, if X is smaller than 10 to the minus 16, then this is no longer one because yeah, we cannot tell whether adding X to one is different than one and so on, yeah. So in our case, this X is the relative energy difference between the vertices I and J, where I and J are from one to four. So it's like the, the sum of, yeah, the relative difference between these energy differences at two different K points in a, in a tetrahedron. So if this number is too small, which means that the energy values at difference values at two vertices are very similar to each other, it's per, it, in reality, it's perfectly fine. There is no singularity at all. So the four, for example, if the energy eigenvalues at four vertices are the same, then it is, there is no singularity. It's just easy, right? We can just calculate the, the integral easily, right? But in numerics, uh, there is this problem. So if the energy eigenvalues are very similar to each other, then we have, we are really in trouble. So our simple solution is that we assume that all the axes the energy differences between different vertices are sufficiently uh, large and they're very different. And if the relative energy difference between two different vertices is below a criterion and we uh, force them, the, the energy eigenvalues to be different, we, we force them to be different so that it's the same as the criterion. Okay, so the X remains uh, above certain critical value. And so here we analyze the error for a single tetrahedron, uh, evaluating the, the spin hole conductivity, but we gave uh, different energy values at these four vert vertices, many random different values and see how the exact value, how the error depends on um, the, how close these energy eigenvalues are at the four vertices. And uh, to calculate the error, we used quadruple precision and then we compare with the double precision results. So if our, uh, this critical value criterion is too large, it's one. So if the, any, any vertices is closer in energy than this, and we just uh, uh, make the difference large, then the problem is that, so if the X value is smaller than this, this the criterion, then we just, uh, the error is, remains very large because yeah, we use the force value. And so we reduce the criterion a little bit. And then the same thing happens when the X becomes smaller than the criterion, but now the error is smaller than this, this guy, right? And then the same thing happens and then the, the thing happens like this, but if our criterion is too small, then the, the, the problem of logarithm happens. So this error increases before reaching the criterion. And so, and, and it goes like that. So, which means that there is some optimal criterion value. 
depending on the precision of your, yeah, what you what precision you're using. Okay, so um, uh, here is the comparison between adaptive smearing method and improved tetrahedron method. And uh, so you can see, so these are the imaginary part which you can neglect. And, but these are the, the non-dissipative uh, part result. And you can see that they converge at much faster rate. But um, this thing takes longer time. So uh, one has to also compare the time. Um, and yeah, this is the result. So average wall clock time and the y-axis is the error. And so uh, this is the adaptive smearing method and this is the best uh, uh, tetrahedron method. And you could see that at a given amount of time, we can reduce the error uh, by orders of magnitude in comparison with the adaptive smearing method. And also he, this one shows the, that there, uh, we changed the, the criterion value and change the mesh size and then so how the error evolves. And indeed there is some optimal range where the error is minimal. So Minsu implemented uh, this in his uh, version of post fania 90, am I right? It's, yeah, okay. And he's considering to implement that in Vanya Berry. So maybe uh, today uh, we could discuss further on this. And uh, Thanks, uh, Jerome, you asked me the question about degeneracy. And actually, uh, it turns out that the degeneracy issue is not uh, severe here because we add everything. And so each tetrahedron, it's uh, psychologically, it's, I, I don't like it because uh, if you ever do the trace over the degenerate bands, then it will be smooth function. But if we don't do that, it will be a rapidly varying function. But still, if you add everything, then it will be the same. But it's a big num large number minus large number becomes small number. So there could be some precision issue, but we, we have tested, uh, means to test yesterday and so far we didn't find that. But psychologically, I want to uh, uh, do the trace some. Yeah, so thanks for the nice suggestion. So this is the end of my talk. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Shoban, for this nice talk. So let's start with questions. So is it possible also to add the, the blockle corrections? Because they, they also, are, in the usual band theory context, they, they improve the accuracy quite, quite a lot. Sorry, to add what? The blockle correction. So you don't have a, a, a flat surface crossing touch region, but a curved one. Ah. So, so that uh, means we have thought about. It's a rather uh, simple correction term <laughs> in the usual form. Maybe means could comment on that. Yeah. Uh, the the blocks, blocks correction does not work in this case because the, the blocks, blocks correction works for the analytic integrant, right? So in this case, the, the <clears throat> integrant is a linear function or linear function. So it can be singular at some point. So the blocks correction works by Gauss theorem. So this, the Gauss theorem does not apply here. Yeah, thanks. More questions? More questions? Nope. Uh, I had some questions. Um, okay, first. Very technical. When you do this uh, ch change of energies at vertices, do the, uh, to avoid uh, the these problems, uh, do you, do you need to do it consistently because one vertex belongs to different tetrahedron, or it doesn't matter really? Minsu, I <laughs> I don't <laughs> remember. <laughs> Can you comment on that? So, so you mean the, no, I, the ch change of energy, energy eigenvalues, different tetrahedrons. Different. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but the change is applied in a single tetrahedron, and, and calculating other tetrahedron, uh, we 
use the original eigenvalues. Ah, so you don't change. So the change is confined to a single tetrahedron, I think. Is, is that what you said? Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, and that, uh, there's a question. Uh, if instead you interpolate both, uh, I'm still standing here just in case. It means we will answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, <clears throat> you interpolate both the numerator and the denominator. So, and uh, it uh, becomes quite, you, as you say, computationally more heavy. If you interpolate only the denominator, the energy part, we would make calculation uh, lighter and uh, how much uh, worse will become the, the convergence. That seems to be a very good question, uh, but um, means you have you looked into that, just changing the, <clears throat> doing the interpolation for uh, energy denominator? No, not yet, but... Uh, <clears throat> um, because the interpolation was not a bit bottleneck, so uh -huh. uh, so I uh, I just I just interpolated both of them. Okay, so it doesn't increase the computational time too much. I no, but you in the talk you said that with the Trahedron method, it becomes uh, like it takes longer time to compute. You right. said this, so, so why, why is that then? Ah. So if you just do energy tetrahedron, energy tetrahedron, then does the computation time reduces in half or how much is, will it be reduced? Do you have feeling for that? That's the cost <coughs> computation. <coughs> Sorry. Computational time has two contributions, uh, uh, obtaining matrix elements or eigenvalues and uh, the summation of tetrahedron over six and tetrahedron so uh, <clears throat> uh so the, uh, the summation is more computational time and uh so the <clears throat> so so just interpolating both of them is not not equal to two to double double of only interpolating energy eigenvalues okay thank you Normal questions. Oh, just a general question about the first part about Vanier function perturbation theory. So, if I understood correctly, uh, the motivation for this was those types of problems like spin hole connectivities, where you cannot recast the expressions in a geometric form involving k derivatives, so you cannot avoid doing the summation over states. Is that correct? Yes. So what are the other, do, do, have you thought about which other problems are somehow this method is good for? Is it spin related problems, phonons and what else? Yeah, spin related problems, phonons, and also um, <clears throat> uh, the dynamical Born effective charge ah. is also falls into that category. Nice, okay. By Stengel and uh, Sinisa. Sinisa. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, then we send the, uh, send the speaker again. Thank you. So now do we have some flash talks? Yeah. How many we have? Don't sorry. For me? Yeah. So the first one is yours, actually. Me? Okay. So so maybe. 